Freedom HealthWorks is the direct primary care accelerator. We help doctors across the country start fresh in direct primary care. With Freedom HealthWorks, you work with a team, not a checklist. Visit freedomhealthworks.com and together we can achieve true freedom in direct care. The Benjamin Rush Institute has been on a really noble journey. Tell us more about what you're doing and where you're going. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, BRI has been around for, depends on who you ask, between nine and 13 years. Uh, Our founder, Sally Pipes, uh, is from Canada. Um, Sally moved to the United States uh, and joined the Pacific Research Institute and really saw that she didn't like where the healthcare system in the United States was going and founded under the auspices of the Pacific Research Institute, the Benjamin Rush Society. Sally lost her sister um, under, the, under the Canadian healthcare system and was really afraid that, she, that our the United States healthcare system was headed in the same direction. Um, and with Benjamin Rush Society, our, the mission was to affect healthcare through medical students, to start medical students in learning um, different avenues of healthcare than they were learning in medical school. Medical school is primarily funded by big business, by big healthcare, by big pharma, and they're not learning alternates, um, alternatives to those kind of healthcare. So they're not learning about things like direct primary care, about economics that are um, different than what big, you know, that big pharma and big government and what um, what the government is saying that they have to do. So overregulated healthcare. It's not really getting to how to maintain the doctor-patient relationship. And that's what BR, the Benjamin Rush Society, and then independent from the Benjamin Rush Society, Benjamin Rush Institute, is trying to do. Um, we're into education. Our main goal is educating uh, medical students on free market healthcare alternatives so that maybe they're not going to open um, a direct primary care facility or right after medical school. And maybe they're not going to, um, you know, go work for a, a specialty that is direct care or something like that right out of medical school. But mm-hmm. with the dropout rate um, or the burnout rate of doctors being at some say at 60%, um, what my personal goal is, is that five, 10 years down the line, these doctors know that there are alternatives to how they're being forced to practice medicine and that they know where the, where, what they can do. And that's what we're about. Gotcha. I, th- I find it absolutely fascinating that this institute and society was founded by a physician coming from what we're going to call a socialized medicine system, realizing that, hey, this isn't as great as some of the headlines will show it is. And then we don't want to go that route in this country. I found that very, it, it, that's a very powerful message to bring to the next generation of physicians and physician leaders. Um, how are they responding to that? Are, are you seeing people say, uh, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense or no, I don't believe it? All over the country, we see these young doctors to be with their eyes just popping open when they're learning uh, what they don't know. I, I always tell the story that my third week at BRI, um, I was in a school in the South um, with a bunch of first and second year medical students. And we were doing a, um, a talk with a direct primary care doctor. Um, and this doctor uh, had opened up her, her direct primary care clinic about three years prior. Um, but she was a doctor. She's a fantastic uh, doctor. Her name is Dr. Amy Walsh uh, in North Carolina. Um, she had practiced medicine for 20 years. She had done all different kinds of medicine. And she decided she didn't want to do medicine anymore um, by accident. And she walked away um, by accident. She fell upon um, a direct primary care conference in Florida. And for the first time in her career, after 20 years and walking away, she learned about direct primary care and mm-hmm. her whole being changed. She said, that is the type of medicine I want to practice. And 18 months later, she opened up her clinic. 
she tells the story, but she also tells the finances of it. She tells how it can work. You know, you're not going to become a millionaire, but doctors aren't becoming millionaires anymore. They're doing it because they want to practice medicine. Right, um, right. And these first and second year medical students are learning about direct primary care, but they're also learning how they can practice medicine, how they can maintain financial solubility, but they're seeing that there is a path to do this and it makes perfect sense to them paying down their debt that they're getting in medical school, but also how they can maintain this path throughout their career. And it's making sense to them in their first and second year of medical school by this really great doctor. And this is not stuff they're learning. This is not thing. These are not things that they're learning in medical school. Um, and it's fascinating. And that's the kind of person that we want to bring. What's more interesting to me right now, and not just, I shouldn't say more interesting, but what's just as exciting to me is that there are other direct care specialties. Um, I would love there be a ton of direct primary care doctors or specialists that um, can go and talk to all doctors. But the fact is not all medical students are doing primary care as their specialty. But mm -hmm. more and more throughout the country, there are other specialists doing direct care. And they're willing to talk to our doctors as our students as well. Um, we also bring in policymakers and policy specialists uh, to our students. And they're talking about different things, whether it be the economics, the insurance, um, the business aspect like yourself, all of these different things are being spoken to to our students and they are surprised. They're surprised because what they're being taught is regulation and coding and the three different prescriptions that they're allowed to prescribe for strep throat. These kinds of things are what they're being taught. Um, there's a whole new world and there's a whole other world that they can practice and that's what we need to keep bringing them. They need to become the advocates for the next generation because without them, that's, this is the kind of medicine that we're going to have to be practicing. Right. So big uh, emphasis on education, big emphasis on advocacy. And I, I, I want to ask this question um, as a lead into talking more about what people are doing in medical schools, but who exactly was Benjamin Rush? Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin Rush was one of the founding fathers. He, um, he signed the Declaration of Independence. Um, he was, he's known as the father of American psychology. Um, he took a stand. Um, and some people say, you know, he, he, gets, he gets a bad rap like a lot of founding fathers. But for us, he, I mean, he, was, he's, he believed in free market health care um, long before there was the word free market health care. And we stand behind him because of that. Um, he was a, you know, being a founding father, being one of uh, the, the founding members of our society and believing in the doctor patient, um, that relationship so early on, um, he's a great person to, that we can call, that we can stand behind as an organization. And one of the, one of five uh, physicians to sign, I believe the Declaration of Independence. That's right. Good job. Hey, thank you. Thank you. We, we, know we, we take our research quite seriously here in <laughs> Americana. So I wanted to ask that to get a basis of why uh, your organization was named after him and what his influences uh, were, uh, seeing how you're very rooted in medical school. So what type of yeah. models of healthcare delivery, as I'm going to call it, um, think of healthcare delivery mm -hmm. as a, uh, um, you know, direct care is one delivery model, fee-for-service yeah. is one. Medicare for all would be another one. What are your members learning in medical school and what's the chatter about uh, with all the students? I mean, I think right now, especially with the election going on, you are getting a lot of, um, you know, single payer, Medicare for all. It, it's not quiet. I think, you know, with the election, especially, we are getting, um, Physicians for National Health Care is loud. Um, it's, it, you know, they're teaching, they're on campuses. They are, um, they have students for national health care. And um, that's what we're up against. We're up against a, a very loud, um, a very loud presence that's teaching about Medicare for All, that's t teaching about single payer. Um, you know, but we ran up against this before with Obamacare. We ran up against our students that believe in what we're doing 
um, going against uh, this loud chatter before. Um, you know, what they're running against is the same, the same statistics, no matter what, those statistics being, and this is what TNH, uh, Physicians for National Health Care, um, repeats over and over again. 62% of all personal bankruptcies um, are because of lack of health care. 31% uh, of every health care dollar goes into the private insurance uh, bureaucracy. We hear these over and over again but they're failing to talk about what um you know the 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 other the pros and the cons of what having um medicare for all is going to do mm -hmm. um that's why we do things and i love i'm i'm such a fan of debates i love debates because um i think especially with medical students we're not talking about you know people yelling at each other it's not really that kind of debate we have um what we call our um you know we have a debate series that we're talking about single payer um and i love doing it and we've debated we've had a ton of people from physicians for national health care um where we're bringing this debate to campuses all over the country and what's great about it is we, you know, we have those people on, I'll say our side, um, that have done this research and are firmly grounded in their opinions. Um, we also have the people that are firmly grounded in their opinions and have done a ton of research on single payer. Both sides aren't going anyplace, but it's that middle. It's that middle that doesn't have all of the education, that doesn't understand the difference, the actual difference between single payer and universal health care that doesn't understand that there really is a difference when we're talking about that. These are really, really bright people. Um, but when you're getting into the nuances, be, the nuances between what single payer is um, and that Medicare for all is a type of single payer, but that they're not actually completely interchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, these are the type of things that these doctors to be really need to understand because they're the ones that are going to be influencing this policy when they get that md after their name they are so powerful um and that's something that by bringing these debates um to their campuses we're really getting some great people to um to talk about this in a really educated and um powerful way and that's something that we're really trying to do all over the country yeah, it's great to hear because we're big fans of debate. Um, like you said, a, a debate that isn't confrontational, like you see in the screaming matches, yeah. uh, if you turn on the, yeah. the, uh, the national news here, um, there's so much emotion in it. And this is an emotional uh, subject, really is, with health care. Absolutely. But being able to have a civil debate and express the, like you said, the pros and cons on both sides is going to be going to be absolutely huge. So, so let me ask you this: What is the appeal of a single payer or a Medicare for all system with the younger medical students? What's driving this uh, influence? Well, I think I mean I think we talked about it a little bit there. Um, you're talking about doctors that really do care. You're talking about these young people that really do want um, that really do want to affect as many people as they can. They mm -hmm. do worry that people aren't getting as much health care as they can. And when you do, when you are looking at some of these young people that have spent time in an inner city, that have spent time volunteering, that have spent time working, and see people without health care. Um, that's the number when you know PNHP is giving that number um, of six, you know, people going into bankruptcy because of health care bills. Um, they're seeing a single payer being the same as um, everyone is going to get insurance or health care. Everyone right. is going to receive health care. Um, they're not looking at the fact that we're not, we're talking about your quality of care going down. We're not we're talking about the fact that you're not going to have any relationship with your patients. What they're seeing instead is kind of an idealized, you know, liberal view of everybody's happy, everybody's, you know, everybody's receiving the same kind of care. It's it's not the the best care and that's what we need to move away from. Um right. right, right. You know, it's a it's a cheaper alternative, but that doesn't mean that it's better. It's a more widespread version, but that doesn't mean that it's better. And there's so many places to point to. 
Um, you know, they're not looking at doctors getting paid less money. And again, that's not what we should be looking at. You know, they shouldn't be looking at doctors getting paid less money. They shouldn't be getting worried that, you know, hospitals worrying that their, their funding is going to be getting cut. Um, all of, you know, pharmaceutical limiting, you know, pharmaceutical companies worrying um, how much they can charge for their, drug, their drugs. All of these are things that can and will happen under a Medicaid for all plan, but they're looking at, is everybody going to receive care? Well, yes. Right, right. But so is you, it the same, you know? Yeah, yeah. So they're looking at this as, okay, everybody acknowledges that there is a problem, right? I wouldn't be sitting yes. on this end of the microphone. You wouldn't be sitting on that side of the microphone if there wasn't okay. some type of problem in the greater healthcare industry. So I, what, what, it, what it sounds to me like is that they think right now healthcare in the United States is what you and I would consider to be a free market, which it is not. It's That's the closest it. thing towards not. really an, an oligarchy that we, we've possibly had. And it's a gov government subsidized oligarchy. You know, there's four big insurance companies and then there's a big pair uh, from uh, CMS up at the, the federal level there. And so it, let me know if I'm, if I'm getting this right and, and how I'm painting this picture. But yeah. the younger generation is looking at this and saying, well, the free market has failed us, even though we don't have a free market in the healthcare industry. And since it has failed us, the only other opportunity we have is to swing the pendulum, which would be in the complete opposite side of what organizations like BRI and what companies like Freedom Health Works are trying to do and give all that monopoly power to the United States government, which, as we know, if anybody has used the VA system or even seeing uh, you know, the Postal Service, pension funds, or anything like that, I could give you a myriad number of examples it's not the most efficient way to run things. Am I getting that right in that yeah. assessment that there's so much misunderstanding here that they it's kind of a knee jerk response of, well, it's all broken. So we have to go this route and just give all the control to the government and that'll solve everything. You know, I, and I think that's, I, I think you have the, I think you do have the pendulum. I think, you know, you're looking at a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren and you have one just drastic side of the equation which is give everything to the government and let them handle it. And there's people like myself that are like, oh my gosh, what are you thinking? Because we <laughs> have seen, we, we've seen what that can do. We've seen what, what a government, government takeover of anything is going mm -hmm. to do. Um, you know, it scares me when we're talking about education. It scares me when we're, do, we're talking about anything where the government is in complete control of an entire system. Um, but, you know, then you look at something like uh, a Joe Biden plan, which is preserving a role for private insurance, um, implementing more of like a, a public option, which gives them uh, an option of buying a government health plan. I don't necessarily agree with all of that either, but even looking at a Biden plan is saying, hold up, we need to find a middle ground here. And I think that's what more rational people are saying is that it's broken. We need to fix it. We need to find where we stand here because we can't go full blown Bernie Sanders. Um, but what is that middle ground? Because it's broken. Where, where we are now is broken. We need to find that middle ground. Sure, um, sure. And so and I'm, no, I'm, I'm not a huge where fan. Where is of, that going to be? Yeah, and I'm not a huge fan of the private insurance industry and how it functions right now. I believe there is a, uh, yeah. a huge role for them, but I'd like my health insurance to function a lot like my house, my, my homeowner's insurance, you know, some catastrophic event, yeah. some emergency. It's there. You know, I don't want to be left outside or anything like that. So I get where people are coming from, especially the younger medical students saying, yep. hey, DR, there are real cases where people are suffering because they can't get access to the care. We're always quick to remind people that yep. coverage does not equal care when it comes to your health yep. and the healthcare industry. Uh -huh. I think a lot of people confuse those two terms, unfortunately. But um, so Absolutely. within this discussion and within this, this uh, educational movement, Surely, organizations that are supposed to represent physicians, such as the AMA, surely they have mm -hmm. the best interests of future physicians and current physicians in mind when they try to influence educational curriculum. 
I have a lot of respect for the AMA. I do. AMA has been around forever, and they're supposed to be the representatives of the doctors. Um, the American Medical Association is um, the largest medical association that represents doctors and physicians. Um, and as of uh, as of 2004, when they started the Patients Action Network, um, they're talking. Their their actual verbiage is in response to legislative issues that the AMA feared would, wait for it, harm the patient-doctor relationship and restrict patients' access to healthcare. Those are awesome words. For somebody like me, those are fantastic words. And if you look at the issues that they're following, prior authorization, drug price transparency, health system reform, uh, MACRA, which is Medicare, uh, Medicare physician payment, uh, opioid use, telemedicine, graduate medical education. I, as one, for me, I don't have a problem with those issues at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are issues that I feel the AMA really should be following. What I do have a problem with is when the AMA moves from those issues to climate change education and in, in medical schools and health ed, ed, uh, one more time, health ec economics in medical school. Those two issues I feel the AMA should not be a part of. Those are policy issues. Those are policy, those are really partisan policy issues in my, in my opinion. Sure. Sure. And those are two issues that in the past six months, the AMA has taken, a, taken part in. Um, and never before in, that I can find has the AMA gotten, become that partisan. Um, even in their, in their donating, they've been pretty 50-50. Some would say the AMA has even been more Republican. Um, but in the past six months, these are two issues that they've become, uh, real, become really hot button issues for the AMA. Um, insisting in climate education, climate change education in medical schools. I don't understand why that would be something that they are enforcing in, med enforcing in medical schools. But then health ec economics as well. Yeah, climate change, it kind of scratches my head, um, you know, for anybody out there, no matter what your beliefs are or which, which science uh, articles. I'm not going to wade into that debate, but to be, have that taking place in medical school, it <laughs> is a little interesting. You, you kind of think, well, I'm not sure I want my physician to be able to pull up the latest uh, uh, NASA reportings on temperatures, but interesting stuff there. I want to I want to I want to zero in on what you said about the health economics subject because yeah. I again we talk to a lot of physicians um, through Freedom Health Works that they need a lot of help with the business aspects which I totally get it you know I yeah. went to business school they went to medical school we work really well together so I think right now the latest stats that I was able to see that most physicians have about five hours of what we'll call business education. Um, through yeah. undergrad and graduate school. So on the surface, being an advocate for more uh, economic uh, uh, education seems like a good idea uh, until I ran into an interesting quote from uh, a friend of the show and, and I know a, a board of advisor for the Benjamin Rush Institute, Dr. Beth Haynes, and yeah. she expressed concern that AMA is going to be, AMA uh, isn't going to be balanced in presenting the health economics as education. And I think this is a worry for you as well, but why would a narrative being, why is this narrative being pushed in medical schools and not giving a, really a, 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 the, the, the fairness that you would think a, an economics subject would be given? I really wish that the, I, what you just said was, is a perfect example of where we should be going. Um, the AMA should be saying we need to do business in bus more business education in medical schools. That's something we absolutely should be doing. We should be having more business. Um, the, our medical students shouldn't be going out into the real world um, without more business um, mandated business courses under their belt. Um, I do not know a medical student that won't say that, that feels that they're not prepared. Mm -hmm. um, what we can't imagine is, and what we're not seeing as medical schools are starting to implement this economics education, is that it's not um, that it's not kind of 
that there's not an expectation that the economics that they're explaining doesn't include an explanation, um, an expectation of compensation. Um, that what you what you're seeing is not the economics examples of um, you know Friedman and von Mises, but is more of the um, government intervention. Um, so messing like with not, not a natural um, supply and demand cycle where the supply yeah. the demand naturally through market forces more along the lines of something that is uh, oh interference and then you have manipulated markets. That's it. The yeah, like the only way to get uh, to where the the medical the medical profession and you know where transactions are going to make sense between a doctor and a patient is through a government transaction, um, and right. the government has to be in the middle of it. Um, and there's plenty of there's plenty of supporters of that. Um, that's how that's how regulations are right now, and that's how that's how regulations are set up. And if you include any kind of um, economics like that, then you're missing a whole section of how the free market works. Um, and if that's the only type of economics education that you're giving, then everything that we're trying to do and all the alternatives to that aren't going to make any sense. Um, and that's what we want to make sure. We want to make sure that um, you know, some of these students that are going into medical school have economics degrees. And that's what we're hearing more and more. It's actually a little bit helpful to me um, as these um, as these new education uh, initiatives are being rolled out. I'm getting these very smart medical students that are coming and opening their eyes and saying, wait a minute. Um, it's good that you're teaching us, us about anatomy and you're teaching us about uh, pharmaceutical um, and you're you're teaching us about surgery, but when you get into this, you're missing something. And that's because medical students are going to school right now with advanced degrees going into getting their MDs. They're going to school already with crazy leadership skills. Um, so when it comes to economics, you are getting people. Um, I have two doctors that are two medical students that have PhDs in economics going into medical school. Oh, so. Wow. They're looking at this going, wait a minute. And I love that because they're pushing back where I never could. I can't get anybody smarter than that. Right. So it's kind of fun. It's kind of right. fun to actually see this being rolled out because my students already are raising their hands and saying, hold up. Um, so in a way, I love it. But in a way, I need to make sure that those other schools that don't have PhDs um, <laughs> sitting in the seats. Um, I need to, we need to make sure we need to find a way where we can push back and say, wait a minute, you're missing a whole bunch. And it's just, it just adds another, it adds another layer to what we have to push back on. Yeah. A little disappointing that um, that type of narrative is coming from the AMA, but good to hear that there are uh, people who see through it and say, wait a minute, there, there's a different way from doing this. And, you know, history has given us a lot of real world examples of what does work and what doesn't work. And, Unfortunately, you know, uh, for for the utopian uh, crowd out there, life's always not that fair. So I want to talk a little bit about how BRI is continuing to grow and what's the type of programming that you're continuing to roll out and how are people responding? So we, how, we, how we're set up is we have um, chapters at medical schools throughout the country. Um, that is an individual, so like a club that you've started at your school. Um, and why we set it up as an individual club or organization is it provides us with a little bit more autonomy. Um, you're not going to, most, med most medical schools aren't going to ask a, um, you know, a, a direct primary care doctor or a policy person from the Cato Institute to come in as a guest lecturer. Um, but if we have a club or organization, which has already gone through the process of becoming an independent club, um, it allows us a little bit more autonomy to um, ask whoever we want to come. Um, we work with the students directly. So my, me and my staff um, work with the students directly to support them in any way they need to set up that club. So, you know, we help them with paperwork and go through that process. But that, that, that part is pretty much on them. Um, we help the students in any way we can. We help find speakers. Um, 
we pay for food. Uh, you know, it's, it's different than having just a, a club. They're supported by a national organization. Um, and that's something that we're very proud of. Um, I was brought on to do just that, um, to really be the, be the backbone of these, these um, chapter leaders. Um, mm -hmm. we, they're medical students first and foremost, and we really appreciate the fact that they want to keep um, this movement moving as much as possible and educate people that might not know about these alternatives in free market um, healthcare. So that's something that we're here to do. Um, and how we grow is a lot of word of mouth. Um, so people, things like this podcast, uh, doctors in different areas that might know a medical student, um, professors that might have a student or might want to help start a club, um, a Benjamin Rush chapter at their, um, at their school. Um, we've had a lot of growth in the past 18 months, um, and it's because of, you know, great partnerships like with you and, and your group. Um, you know, we've gone from about 23, 25 to about 40 right now, um, but there's a lot of medical schools out there. Um, we've right. built, we've gone into residence, into residencies um, this year as well, which is a really exciting thing. Um, but with this election, we need to keep growing. Um, there's nothing more important to me and to Benjamin Rush Institute than hitting as many medical students as possible. Um, we need people to know, we need these doctors to be to know the issues that are going on today so that we can continue to talk to them tomorrow and make them advocates for um, everything that's going on today, tomorrow, and the next tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Rebecca, I, I, we're going to move on to our, what I call our crystal ball segment here. And this is where I get to ask all of our guests, <laughs> what's next in healthcare from your perspective? So take a minute or take a second, not a minute, take a second, gaze in your crystal ball. Where do we go from here? We have to, we were, we're going to I think in the next four years, we will reform um, Obamacare in some way. Um, absolutely. Um, I don't think, I think it will be on the early side of the next four years. I think it's going to be a major issue in the next president, it, whoever the next president, president is. Um, I think, I think direct primary care is going to be a big part of that. I think whatever insurance um, issues take place. I think direct primary care is going to have a major part in that. <laughs> I think we're actually going to have a bill that's written the right way. And I think that will be done, <laughs> I think, in the next legislative session. That well, that'd be nice. is my ball, crystal ball. That'd be nice. That's, uh, that is my, that's what I say. You're painting a, a very rosy picture I, there, a very attractive picture there. I like that. I like that. I think I could subscribe to that vision. I'm, that's easily. what I'm going for. I'm going to go bigger. <laughs> I'm going to go I'm going to go faster than Obamacare. I'm going to say something's going to happen with the direct primary care bill in the next legislative session. Perfect. I love it. I love yep, it. Yep, I'm, I'm going. I'm going for it. <laughs> well, Rebecca, <laughs> thanks for taking time to chat with us today. Uh, if anybody out there is interested in learning more about uh, the Benjamin Russ Institute, Benjamin Russ Society, what's the best way to find out more information or contact you? Uh, BenjaminRushInstitute.org is our website, and I am Rebecca at BenjaminRushInstitute.org. Please send me an email, um, and I would love to speak with you. Perfect. There we go. Rebecca, thanks again. We wish you the best of luck and look forward to following all your successes. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Very welcome. Healthcare Americana is powered by Freedom HealthWorks, editing provided by Taylor Scott and iPodcast Pro. I'm Christopher Habig. Thanks for listening. Hi again, everyone. This is Chris. At Healthcare Americana, we're always on the lookout for great stories to tell in the healthcare industry. And we'd like to hear yours. Check out healthcareamericana.com and send us your ideas for episodes or if you'd like to be a guest. Thanks again for listening. Hope you enjoy it.